to explain we're going to take this through there is not a business meeting in any way it's going to be pure praise and thanksgiving we've got a harvest theme and in particular we're following the harvest notes that were sent by christian rebuild which refer a lot to events in syria and in particular in aleppo our main speakers are going to be ivan and janet and we do welcome both of them to this meeting and we know that we enjoy what they have to say. Janet has asked that we should have Bibles. There will be a break somewhere around about 20 past 11 and that will be for 10 minutes allowing you to get comfort breaks but also to go and fetch the Bible if you want it because it is needed for the second rather than for the first half of our things today. Uh, I've just got there. Yes, apologies for our president, Steve, and the Reverend Martin Spain is kindly going to take the parts that Steve might have taken. And so we are grateful that he is going to do that. And now I notice already we have done things wrong because I have butted in to do this before Moira, who was going to do it the other way around. But can I welcome Moira and ask her if she will lead us in with a welcome and then hand over to Martin. Yeah. Good morning all and welcome to the Congregational Federation in Wales first autumn assembly ever to be held in Zoom. Personally I would prefer to meet you face to face and to share as usual, the chat around a lovely tea at the end of our meeting. And I'm sure you'd all prefer to do it that way as well. But this morning, we are pioneers due to Matthew's expertise. Thank you. I'm sure everything will go absolutely smoothly with not even one little blip. Can you imagine how the lockdown would have been without technology. Without a mobile phone, without your laptop, without a tablet. We can FaceTime people, we can Skype people, we can chat with people and we can Zoom for meetings. We can see family and friends, we can hear them and we can reach the wider community. And we also have had our wonderful online services, Bible studies, deacons meetings. Technology has come to the forefront and we thank you for it, Lord. And we should have been holding this meeting in Ruderin. And we are planning to hold a spring assembly there in 2021. Only all we can do is plan, and many plans have been changed for everyone due to COVID-19. Our lives are continually changing. It's like sifting sand, but we have God as our foundation to guide us through these worrying times. And so I thank you all for attending this morning. And I extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you and pray that God will richly bless us as we join together in worship. And I give you all a virtual handshake. <laughs> I think it's over to me to give the call uh, to worship and I'm grateful to Chris for supplying me with the script as well uh, for today. Good morning all, lovely to see you and see some very friendly faces and being that we're mostly from Wales of course some smiley faces as well because I think we've got better weather here than they've got in some parts of the country today so I'm looking out on bright sunshine certainly out here in the west. So let's hear the call uh, to worship. The first scripture sentence is from uh, the book of Philippians. My deep desire and hope is that I shall never fail in my duty, but that at all times, and especially right now, 
I shall be full of courage so that with my whole being I shall bring honour to Christ whether I live or die. The desert will sing and shout for joy. It will be as beautiful as the Lebanon mountains and as fertile as the fields of Carmel and Sharon. Everyone will see the Lord's splendour, see his greatness and power. And the second one is from the book of Isaiah, of course. So we come now to our time of prayer. So let us pray. We're taking the prayers from the Christian Rebuild Harvest resource and three of us will be leading them. God of seeds and flowers and fruit. I think Moira is muted. Oh, thank you for the food <laughs> on our table. And the countless people who provide it. Help us not to waste the good things you have given. While so many live in poverty. God of forests, mountains, plains. Thank you for the wonders of this amazing world. With more to discover than we ever imagined. Forgive us our carelessness and greed. That threaten the life and health of our planet. God of cities, streets and homes. Thank you for houses and buses, shops, and churches and for Skype and Zoom, the World Wide Web and social networks. Help us to build and rebuild our communities as we go forward. And forgive us when we let people feel lonely. God of vision, plans and work. Thank you for the harvest of our lives. Especially in these last few months when we may have learned new things. Help us to use the time you have given. To bear your good fruit in our lives. God of the harvest. We thank you and praise you. Amen. 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 Oh, good morning. good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. It is sunny in Liverpool as well, Martin. <laughs> um, so uh, the blinds are closed. So this morning, uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the CF, but also just to focus on this uh, profile from one of the young girls in the church, one of the congregational churches in Syria. Um, we have uh, a pioneering day also happening today and um, I hope someone's been in touch with you to say that if you wanted us to redo that day for Wales we could do so that you can be part of it because I know it was clashing with today but also next week we're hosting a light night party um, for any families or children within your churches I'll share the link with you so that you can allow them to see that um, and also just launched this week as well Walter has written a short play on the first two books of Job so please go onto the website and have a little look at those things for you to to ponder on okay I'm going to share my screen now and you should be able to see a picture of this young gal from one of the congregational churches in um, Syria and she is called Tallinn are you ready Kant Baden. And this is a beautiful young girl. And this is her story. My name is Talyn Cantus Baden, and I am the only child in the family. I am an eighth grade student in Bethel School, and my education is my first priority. I love my school very much. The conflict in Syria began in March 2011, when I was in kindergarten class. The Syrians faced many problems, and one of them was the lack of electricity. All the students had to study in candlelight during long power cuts. I am grateful to my school for the educational support provided to me. As a member of the Armenian Evangelical Bethel Church, 
I am a Sunday school assistant teacher. I love spending time with the kids and teaching them stories from the Bible. I have hope that everything will change in my country and I will achieve my dreams in the near future. My biggest dream is to become a successful psychiatrist. What a great story, a uh, great testimony that is. I'll just give you a, a few minutes to just read over that again. I wonder what really um, resonated with you or what what um, what stood out for you in that story. I'll just let you ponder on that before I begin asking you some more questions. So the first I wonder question is, what are your favourite Bible stories? Um, Tanine talks about how she shares her favourite Bible stories and with the children in Sunday school. But what are your favourite Bible stories? And who was the last person that you shared a favourite Bible story with? And the next question I want you to ponder about is this one. God speaks to people sometimes through dreams. Can you think or find some biblical examples of dreamers or who God spoke to through a dream? And the final question, and maybe you might not want to share this, so please don't feel you have to, but I wonder if you have any unfulfilled dreams. And I wonder if we can pray into those unfulfilled dreams that you may have. Okay. So if you want to unmute yourself, would somebody like to um, share some of their favourite Bible stories that they shared within their groups? Group one, can somebody from group one just unmute themselves and share with us? We, we um, thought of the story of Jonah, um, all of the parables, um, particularly people mentioned the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the prodigal son, um, the story of Jesus um, meeting the woman at the well, and um, I think that was that was us, yeah. Yeah, great story. We didn't have any of them, so that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, group two, anyone from group two to share? Which was group two, you know? <laughs> Come on, no. Craig. Go on, you share with us. I don't oh, know what okay. group was well, Craig, where you were. Craig, you were in group two. Gr oh, you that's were in okay. group two, Craig. We did the, uh, the story of the unmuting phone. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we chose the same parable, actually. Uh, it, it was the, the, the parable of the lost sons. Um, uh, and we had a bit of a discussion around that. But then I thought we could have much more discussion after that. Okay. Uh, and then group three? We talked about the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah, that was uh, mine. Uh, sorry, and found it a very humbling story to tell. That's great, thank you. And then group four, Martin, do you want to share the ones we shared? Oh, we harked back to Sunday school days, I think, in our group, because uh, the men in particular <laughs> chose good Old Testament characters for their stories, like David and Goliath and the stories that we had in there, and the call of Samuel. Uh, but we also then looked at some of the parables and the impact that had on on, uh, on on us today, really, the little stories we could relate to. I think that was the uh, that was the response there, wasn't it? Yeah, great. Thank Sorry, you. Yvonne, I've got to mention that um, uh, might also mention Ruth and Esther as being uh, favourites for her. Yes, we had Esther in, in our in our group as yeah. well. Yeah, thank you, Craig. We um, had the story of Ruth as well. I've just forgotten that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so some biblical examples of dreamers. So I'll, I'll say what we had in our group and then maybe if there's any that you also um, shared, then please um, unmute yourself and share them. So we had Samuel, we had Joseph, 
we had Daniel, we had the Christmas story with uh, Joseph and the Kings and um, Mary. Um, and did we have anyone else, Martin? I can't remember. Saul. Saul. We had Saul. Oh, Saul. Yes, Paul. and Peter as well <laughs> and Cornelius. Yeah. Did anyone else have any more to add to that list of some biblical dreamers? Did we get them all? Yay. <laughs> but it's amazing, isn't it, how many... Um, how God uses dreams to be able to um, speak to different characters and to speak to us. And then unfulfilled dreams. We, we won't share these now, but I think it's good to pray into these and ponder on unfulfilled dreams that we have. And then I just want to pull Pop, one of Poppy's um, favourite stories in the Bible, mainly because at the start of lockdown, she watched the musical that was live streamed, is Joseph, of course, who was the, the biggest dreamer, we could say. And this is a verse from Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. And it actually repeats this three times in the whole of that section of Genesis. It says this, that the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. And I just think that is a and it's such a beautiful verse, especially for the story of Joseph when he went through some completely um, devastating times, times when he felt completely lost and alone and must have wondered what on earth was going on. Um, and yet the Lord is with him and he succeeded in everything he did. And I thought this was a great verse and a prayer really for telling for us to pray for her and um, that she knows that the Lord is with her and she will succeed in everything she does by clinging onto this promise as we can take this promise that God gives us to that um, he is with us and he will help and help us succeed in everything that we do okay so that is talent so we thank you to uh, Reverend Haru for sharing the story of this girl and there are other resources and other children that he shares their stories with if that's something maybe you'd like to do in your own Good morning. Hello. I think we're still in the morning, um, but it's the run up to a comfort break. Uh, so we've got 10 minutes. And um, one of the things that um, I've been asked to share about is the work that the Armenian Evangelical Church in Aleppo are doing with um, to support older people. And also I thought we could use it as a springboard to think about ways in which God might be using us to support um, those who are older in our congregations. We're not going to be going into breakout rooms or anything, so you can just sit comfortably. It's a chance just to listen to a few things that I've gathered to share, to reflect and to pray. So after we think of that amazing hymn that we sang, we know that morning by morning we see new mercies um, that God has provided. And our time today has been shaped by celebrating harvest and by worshipping with materials produced by Christian Rebuild, finding out more about their work and mission and sharing some of the stories of the Christians in the areas this charity serves, both young and old, particularly in Aleppo, Syria. The churches and community groups which this charity works alongside have been facing massive challenges, disruptions and unrest, as well as facing the impact of now the COVID pandemic. In Aleppo, Syria, those across the faith and community, faith and wider communities have been dreadfully affected too by the long running and bloody civil war, um, which Tallinn referred to in her story, which as we can see from her testimony has been going since 2011. Um, and I know that the um, Armenian Evangelical Church have said that the issues are particularly affecting their older population um, because they've been, obviously, many older people rely on the church community as a safe place to go to, and many of the churches will have been destroyed because of the civil war, and now it's not safe for elderly people perhaps to attend church communities in the same way. So just in a quiet moment, I'll just lead us in a short prayer um, for the church communities, particularly those who are older in the community of Aleppo. So let us pray. We pray, loving God, for the work of the Armenian Evangelical Churches of Aleppo. We pray for their work amongst the elderly. We ask, loving God, that you uphold church leaders 
as you courageously witness to the love of Jesus there. And we pray especially for the elderly in that city. Loving God, surround them with your loving care and tenderness. Amen. Now, in some way, because of the pandemic, we perhaps can feel a sense of solidarity with those churches across Syria, although to a much lesser extent, because the pandemic has caused a huge amount of change and disruption for us all, perhaps especially for the older folk amongst us, for whom church has always been a safe haven to visit, to have lunch or a morning coffee in, to meet friends or to pray and sing with friends. And since March, much of our cultural and social and religious life has changed beyond recognition. But we still see signs of hope, love and grace. Chinks of light through the cracks of the brokenness of the world. And we have the opportunity to count our blessings and give thanks for God's provision and mercy. I wonder with so many of the foundations in life that we're used to, feeling so shaky right now. I wonder what two things or few things we've been focusing on. And for me, it's been a sense of distillation, really distilling two things, trust in God and live knowing that we are beloved and to reach out in God's love in his name to those in need. We know our own churches and communities have been affected in recent months by temporary closure and uncertainty about the future. And we know that much of the mission and outreach of churches or choirs or in groups have been carried out in care homes or residential housing for the elderly has been stopped or only able to continue under very restricted circumstances. And this is a great sadness for those working in these areas and for those that work aims to touch and uphold. And I'm wondering in these strange times, perhaps more than ever, God calls us to be creative partners in sharing his love, finding new ways to reach people, finding new ways to reach out to people. And Moira's um, amazing introduction and welcome this morning says, praise the Lord, it's the first time we've ever had our assembly online. So we're finding new ways. And the same that amongst all the chaos and mayhem, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed with that being able to join with many people on the phone, including some who have been housebound for years as part of services offered by some of our churches, by phone conference. What a joy to hear us praying together from our own homes, giving thanks to God for scripture passages shared and for the word shared by the preacher on that day, and perhaps sharing a laugh or some family news with each other. This unique and special time of fellowship on the phone, of course, bears little resemblance to how we have met before, but there is still much to give thanks in these times of sharing, praying, singing and praising God together. Most, if not all of us have experienced some kind of lockdown or restrictions in our usual way of living. And in that sense, we have all shared some of the struggles and sense of isolation that so many older people in our community have faced for a very long time. Many of us will be facing considerable challenges in the months that lay ahead. So as well as giving thanks for all the amazing grace-filled ways God has already sustained us and all the ways we have been able to keep in touch with each other, I'm wondering what else we could do to keep the spirit and love of God alive in our communities. What else could we do to be creative partners in sharing God's love, particularly with those who are restricted to their home and those who are older? And if we consider ourselves older, how can we continue to reach out to others and to link up and how can we get the support that we need? Earlier in the week, I had the honour of attending 
an online alumni event about aging and spirituality, which was offered to those who've been on the congregational training courses. Best speaker was James Woodward, who has had a lot of experience in supporting ministry with, for and by older people. And he shared a Bible passage with us. It's two verses from Psalm 71. Do not reject me in my old age, nor desert me when my strength is failing. Now that I am old and grey-haired, God, do not desert me. I'm wondering what we might do in these coming months of autumn and winter to show that we are not deserting those in our congregations and communities who are in their old age. And if we are beginning to feel like we are being left out because of our age, how can we strengthen our connections with others to help us to know the love and care of God, to be creative partners in sharing God's love, because we are God's hands, God's feet, God's hearts in this world. What could we do, I wonder? A phone call? A suitably physically distanced visit? A little gift in the post, perhaps? Sending a letter or a prayer card? What could we do? How can we continue to strengthen and build up our communities in love, faith and joy? And just before we close, I'd like to share a short prayer with you. So shall we come to God in prayer? Living God, we thank you for the work of the Armenian Evangelical Alliance and all of the churches involved with the charity Christian Rebuild. Loving God, we know that often they are working in places of conflict and disruption. So be with them, uphold them, particularly in the work they do with older people. And we pray for those in our churches and communities who are feeling locked in and locked out of what church is now. Help all of us, all of us here present, no matter what age we are, to continue to know that God is using us, whether we're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. God has not finished with us yet. We have so much of your kingdom to complete. We are partners in building your kingdom. So help us to reach out. And there's an adapted prayer from the Bible Reading Fellowship, Prayers for Older People. Help us to make all of our years and our later years count for the kingdom. Help us to live purposefully with the strength that you give us. Help us to live in the security of knowing that we are always in your care and deeply beloved. Help us to continue to find new ways to reach out to our friends, our church and our wider community, to those of all ages, to serve each other with kindness, in love and in faith, with thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can I thank Sarah very much indeed. We're coming to the point where we have a break. Uh, we will be back at half past eleven. During the break, there will be some music. Also pictures of Aleppo or that a couple during the war. The music was composed and recorded by a lady, the wife of a minister in Aleppo, and she composed it as a protest and a statement of ongoing faith and hope in a time 
difficulty right in the middle of the worst part of the war. I'm holding up there for you to see the little thing and the picture of the lady who music we hear during our break. So we come back again at half past 11 and thank you all.
chance to look at the pictures and get some feel for that part. The partly of Aleppo, also some of the scenes on the road between Damascus and Aleppo, and particularly of the city of Hama and the river Orontes. You see the loveliness and the ordinariness, and in some of the pictures you saw the horror of the flames and the smoke and the things and the torture that came to that city. Syria is the country where the name Christian was invented. It has a very long history of Christianity and therefore it remembers many of the early Christians and thinks of the early saints. And one of them who is greatly revered is St. Tecla. Now, a lot of us have never even heard of St. Tecla. There she is. And that picture was given to me as a present for my mother. It was given by the Reverend Mother of the convent of St. Tecla in Malula. Malula is a wonderful town, a town where the people generally speak Aramaic, one of the very few places where the language of Jesus is still spoken. And St. Tecla lived in Malula for much of her life, but she didn't begin it there. She was a lady who was born in Iconium, and there she heard the teaching of St. Paul. She was a high-born lady, Maybe her father was the governor. He was clearly a Roman of considerable status. But when St. Tecla heard St. Paul preaching, she felt the call of Jesus Christ. And she broke off her engagement in order to follow Paul and listen to him 
and do as Jesus has lead in her. Her family were appalled, and after various attempts to force her to believe as they wanted and to do as they wanted, they condemned her to death. And she was taken out and tied to the stake to be burned. But as they came to light the fire and burn her at the stake, there was a thunderstorm of such strength and such ferocity that every attempt to light the fire was put out. And St. Tecla survived. They weren't put off and decided to throw her to the wild beasts instead. But it is said because she had chosen now to live a virgin lifestyle, that although the lions attempted to attack her, the lionesses all protected her. And so she was able to escape from the wild beasts. For a while she joined St. Paul and he was so impressed by her that she is the only woman who was ever licensed to preach by Paul. <laughs> Eventually they separated and again there was an attempt to capture her and to torture her and kill her. She ran away and knew that troops were following her. As she was running towards the city of Melula, she passed a farm. The farmer was just sowing his seed and she asked if he could shelter her, which he did. And she blessed him and blessed his seed and then ran on ahead. Within a couple of hours, the farmer looked out and saw that his seed had not only sprouted, but it had ripened and all the corn was ready to be harvested. And so he went out to start the harvest. And as he did so, the troops that were pursuing Tekla arrived and asked him, had he seen this young woman and described this beautiful young virgin. And he said, yes, I saw her. She passed this way as I was sowing the seed. And there he was now reaping it. So they imagined that the trail was really cold and turned back. The Tecla was protected. However, time came when again they were catching up with her. And she came to an impenetrable escarpment. And after praying, she saw the escarpment open up with a little passage that she was able to run through, hidden from the troops. And she came out in Malula, where she then lived in a cave and taught and healed and spread the word of Christ, living till she was over 90, blessing the people of that area. Now there is what they call a monastery, but in fact is a convent there in Malula. And I know it well. Matthew, if you're listening, could we have the pictures there? There it is. Lovely. Thank you, Matthew. There are the pictures of the convent of St. Tecla, a wonderful place. I once went there and she worked a miracle for me. I was going to Aleppo and I had the most appalling feeling, you know the day feeling you get the day before you break out in a really horrible cold. I was with a gentleman who was a sort of acting as chauffeur and guide. And when we got there, he said, the cave is up there and it's a lot of steps and a big climb. And he said, you go up there and I'll stay down here. And he got out a packet of cigarettes to stay down there. I went up to the cave and I always, when with other people, think, well, it is right when in Rome to do as the Romans. And so, well, I wouldn't normally pray to a saint. I did pray to St. Tecla. And I said, St. Tecla, I've got a very important meeting in Aleppo tomorrow and I can feel this awful cold coming on. Please help me to avoid it. Well, the next morning I got up and my head was as clear as a bell, no sign of a cold. And the guide chauffeur, who didn't want to bother to climb the stairs to go and see St. Tecla, 
had the worst cold I have ever seen in anyone. So she did that and had a little joke. In the convent, they had an orphanage for girls and a school. And I got to know the sisters and particularly the Reverend Mother very well indeed. The Reverend Mother, a tiny little lady that had a will of iron. I wouldn't want to disobey her at all. Indeed, once we were having a meal together and it finished with some grapes. And I did what I guess most Western people would do. I ate the grape and spat the pip out. I'm not, not spitting it out, but I got rid of the pips. And she told me off. She said, they're very good for you. Now you eat them. We grow the grapes ourselves and we know they're good. And my goodness, I ate my pips. You didn't disagree with the Reverend Mother. But she was a lady of kindness, a lady who watched over us and watched over her community, a lady who loved everyone and cared for them. And thus an awful thing happened. This great Christian shrine, and there's another monastery there of monk, for, with monks that held some of the oldest icons and, in the world and the very oldest Christian altar. And one day at the height of the war, some Muslim people who had lived in Malula came to the Reverend Mother and said, we promise that there will be no harm done to Malula. Will you intercede and ask the government troops to leave so that there may be peace here? She believed them and did so. And the government troops believed her and withdrew. And al-Nusra, and the peaceful, apparently, rebels came in and did the most unspeakable things to some of the people of Malula who had remained there. Destroyed the Christian altar, broke down all the beauty of these two monasteries and carried the nuns into captivity. It took an intervention by President Assad himself and a very large ransom for the government to get the, nurses, the sisters out again. But the promise was made and is already being taken into account that Malula will rise again. And the thoughts of the good, courageous and Tekla will be remembered. Now, see, Tekla wrote a prayer. It's a prayer that I say every single morning. Oh God, please accept our prayers. Heal the sick and release our prisoners. Keep and prosper us. Bless our homes and ease our pace. Keep away from us the wrongdoing of the wicked. Send us the angel of peace to do your godly will and to win with your contentment the happy ending. Amen. It's a simple prayer and yet there's so much in it. Just praying out, oh God, please accept our prayers. What are we doing? We are looking at the creation of the universe, the ruler of everything that there is. And we are addressing him knowing that he will accept our prayers because he is our father and has sent his son to intervene on our behalf. Heal the sick and release our prisoners. Well, at the moment, all over the world, we have that prayer for the sick. We can see yet again the rising of this horrible pandemic. And there are prisoners, like the nuns were, real prisoners, held in jails, held by captives they don't love. And there is the picture of the Reverend Mother by her door, a sweet lady, 
who was taken prisoner. But also there are prisoners in homes because we are locked in and prisoners within ourselves who are unable to look out. Keep and prosperous. We all seek that prosperity and the prosperity that must come. The most important is that prosperity within the heart and the mind that enables us to survive whatever evil may happen. Because the wrongdoing of the wicked does occur. And God doesn't always stop. But he does give strength to face what they are doing. We ask for the angel of peace, peace in our hearts. Peace, of course, in Aleppo and in every part of the world. But that inner peace that comes when we see the glory of the face of God. And the ability to do his will. And we ask that we may have a happy ending. The happy ending of being with Jesus and knowing him forever. And can we just see the last slide, which shows you how tiny that Reverend Mother is, but what a spirit lies within, a spirit of strength and of grace. See how little she is, or is it that I am so big? But her spirit is enormous. May the Lord bless Aleppo, bless Malula, and bless each one of us in our homes, as perhaps a further lockdown appears. Amen. And we now go on and ask Martin to read for us. Uh, the reading is from the Book of Acts, uh, chapter 9, uh, 19b to 25. This follows on from when uh, Paul uh, of course, was uh, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and uh, was made blind as a result. Uh, he's been healed. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. And indeed, he's been baptized all in a very short uh, space of time. And this now uh, picks up uh, that story from when he's with the disciples in Damascus. Acts 9, 19b to uh, verse 25. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. May God bless us the reading and listening of that part of his holy word. To his name be glory and praise. Amen. 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 And thank you, Martin. Um, uh, the, we're going to hear now two more stories from the, uh, the uh, um, Harvest Christian Rebuild resource. Um, and then we're going to look at the biblical background to some of the things that were happening here and allow God's word to lead us um, through. So I hope you've got a Bible to hand. Don't worry too much if not, um, but it'd be great if you do. Um, if you hold in your mind for a moment the, the, the picture at the end of that reading, um, it always strikes me as it, with a potential for humour because Paul is being lowered down in a basket um, outside by night from uh, the, the walls of the city of Damascus where he is. Um, and so if you take that picture, hold it in your mind, it's not after all uh, uh, humorous at all, it's terrifying and because he's by night, in the dark, reliant on the strength of his friends who are lowering him down, uh, and uh, really must be quite terrifying for him to be in that sort of position. So hold that image in your mind, and we've already heard some terrible stories of capture 
and attempted escape and escape and betrayal and all those things. Um, we're in a world where, where people live um, in fear of their lives. And so because of that, in that resource for, from Christian Rebuild, we can't put a picture on the screen for the story I'm going to start with, which is one of, of, of capture and fear of capture, because the person who is involved in the story is still potentially in danger. So we mustn't say his name, and I'll try and remember not to do that, um, but we can't show his picture either. So I'm gonna read uh, the story um, from the Christian Rebuild resource. At the height of the civil war in Syria, Aleppo was surrounded by rebel forces and under constant bombardment. Two Christian leaders, Monsignor Gregorius Johanna Ibrahim of the Syriac Orthodox Church and Archbishop Paul Yazigi of the Greek Orthodox Church were kidnapped while they were driving together. And sadly, though there've been reports that they are alive, they remain missing. That's a long, long time that they've been missing uh, and only reports of their life. The rebels made it clear that these was the, were the first and they regarded all Christian leaders as targets. And I know that from uh, my own experience just before that, when I was um, speaker at a conference in Beirut. Um, and while we were there, um, Christian leaders were being um, kidnapped and tortured, but also um, killed in their own churches. Uh, in different parts of the Middle East. So the, this is an ongoing and awful story. Another Christian leader who must remain nameless needed to travel from Aleppo to Beirut on urgent Christian business. He knew that he was a target and that he would be much easier to capture on the road than at home in a government controlled district. He dared not tell anyone, not even his wife, of his plans to travel. He crept out at three o'clock in the morning, if you still got that image of Paul in your mind, by night, met a car with a very brave driver and set on. They left the city traveling at 100 miles an hour. Snipers were known to operate on the motorway and it's harder to hit a speeding vehicle. As soon as they could, they turned off, taking small roads and cart tracks to cross the mountains away from the rebel roadblocks but still in constant danger of being stopped and captured. Fear ended with the crossing of the border and they could proceed like ordinary motorists. The distance from Aleppo to Beirut is roughly the same as that from Holyhead to London. And the journey before the war took around the same time. This trip took 15 hours. Once in Lebanon, the church leader was safe. He could count on his many friends and continue doing good Christian work. Would it not have been wise for him to remain in safety? He stayed, however, for one night, transacted his business and undertook the same hazardous journey in the opposite direction. He felt that his duty was to remain in Aleppo, comforting and suffering with his people. The Bible story tells of another great Christian leader who had murderers looking for him. Paul felt that God was calling him not to stay in the city, but to escape with his life. And if you want to, at a later time, have a look at Galatians 1, 11 to 24, because that tells the story of, of what uh, Paul did after he escaped um, from uh, Damascus. This is all very much part of the same part of the world. Damascus is also very close um, to Jerusalem, about uh, 50 miles away, so I gather. Um, and uh, we'll see in a moment how closely tied together, uh, how closely interwoven uh, the history of Damascus and the history of, of Israel are, right through, through the whole, um, of really, of recorded time, certainly through the whole of, of biblical time. But there's another story uh, that I want to read from the same resource, from the Harvest resource. And it's a story this time, a very ordinary um, uh, people's lives. And it's a story told in that uh, um, resource by uh, Chris Gillam. So the I in the story is Chris. I can't quite manage um, Chris's presence and, and accent um, accents, but uh, I will do my best to tell the story. I had a free afternoon in Aleppo and had gone for a stroll in the souk. 
three young men called me from their open fronted shop to look at their wares. I said I was not buying, but they didn't think that was a good enough answer. We're all thieves here, they said. You may as well be robbed by us as by any of the others. And they offered me a glass of tea. I spent a very happy afternoon, half hour with them. They made no attempt to pressure me into buying anything, but just enjoyed a conversation about my visit and their life and business in the city. When the rebels attacked, one of the first things they destroyed was the souk. My thieving friends and all its stock will have gone up in flames. I have no idea whether they survived, says Chris. I pray that they did. But even if they did, imagine the trauma of seeing the business that you have built your, and your entire livelihood destroyed in a day. And Chris goes on to say, this happened to so many in Aleppo. Do remember them in prayer and giving. They were innocent, ordinary, lively, and in this case, Christian people. So there are the stories, the story of uh, our own Christian friend trying to, uh, managing to get out of Aleppo and uh, uh, getting as far as, as Lebanon where he was safe and then going back. And then the story of these uh, Christian businessmen um, whose livelihood was destroyed. And then I want to finish uh, this uh, input before we turn to scripture um, by reading from uh, an interview. This Christian leader came in fact to Britain and while he was here, I had the privilege of interviewing him. And I asked him some, some questions. He had just made the same perilous journey and traveled all the way to the UK. And I asked him, why are you going back? You know, aren't you tempted, I said, to flee, to stay here? And this is some a uh, shorter bit of his answer. I mean, if you want um, to read more of it, it's in this uh, um, publication, the International Congregational Journal. And uh, I can make copies of that interview available. Um, but of course, that will reveal the identity of the man in question. He says this, actually, he said, the day I left Aleppo, it was all under bombardment, especially the neighborhood where the church is located. Just before that, at the time when I was passing through the neighborhood on my way here with my wife and son, a bomb fell on a large hospital and the whole building fell just 10 minutes after we had passed by. So, this is his words, the situation is horrible. It is not possible to describe the destruction, but the church is there. We cannot promise honey to the people, but we can promise that we will be with them to the end. The church is the vehicle for carrying hope for the people because the church possesses all the power and the energy and the vision and the trust that Christ has given. People are looking for hope to survive, but they don't find any except in Jesus. And then he goes on to say, but Syria today, today's Syria and tomorrow's Syria cannot be rebuilt and restructured without the Christian church. The church must be there. I feel, we feel that Syria was a Christian country. We are not newcomers, the churches. We are inhabitants of, of, of Syria. We are people who have lived here for centuries. Syria is our home. And when something goes wrong in your home, you don't change your home, you fix it. We have our part in fixing Syria. And the Christian churches are still there at the heart of Syrian life. And uh, uh, they're working in many, many different ways. Also, you can read about those in the International Journal um, to see um, what is happening. So if you'd like to lay hold of your Bible and have a look and turn, first of all, to that reading we heard from Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And we heard the reading um, from verses 19b to 25. So if you've got your Bible to hand, have a look at that Acts chapter 9 and beginning at verse 19b, the second half of verse 19, which helpfully has a, um, a little header in my version, Saul preaches in Damascus. And we've heard this, so we won't spend long on it. Um, but if you want to look um, at uh, verses 
verse 22, we can understand a bit why the people there um, in the synagogues wanted to get rid of him because he became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by showing that Jesus was the Messiah. And you'll see that they didn't really understand what was happening if you look back um, at uh, verse 21, because they were hunkering down, hearing that Saul was coming. Um, uh, any Christians there were hiding. Not long before Saul had to escape um, from Damascus, he was the one that was going there to capture and to um, to harm others. We know that he was there at Stephen's stoning to death. So he was not good news for Christians. And then he was there. And it was the Jews who wanted to get rid of him because a minute ago, he was on their side. A real change, a transformation in Paul's um, life, Saul's life to become Paul, the evangelist. And Martin kind of gave the game away because I was going to suggest to you that you look back towards the beginning um, of that same chapter and you find there um, that he was the one who met Jesus on the road and his life was transformed. So I hope you still got the image in your mind of, of Paul escaping from Damascus so that he could carry on his Christian ministry. But now put alongside it another, story, another picture. Now I have to take my glasses off for, to work on the screen um, online because I can't see everything at the same time. Um, and many of you will be in the same sort of um, position. But if you imagine Saul ha had become blind when he met Jesus and have the image in your mind's eye of the scales falling from his eyes and his life being transformed. So we have those two pictures together in front of us as we look at some other Bible passages. So hold on to those. Saul um, uh, with his scales falling from his eyes having met with Jesus and Paul being lowered from the basket, from, from the um, city, escaping. Now, we're going back into the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, I'd like you to turn, if you can, um, to the book of Judges, which is a big chunk of Bible back. I have got a marker in mind, so I'm cheating. And it's Judges chapter five. It's near the beginning. It's after um, all the... the the Pentateuchal ones. We're going to go back to Deuteronomy in a minute, so if you come across that, don't lose it. And then it's after Joshua, and then we come to Judges, and it's chapter five. Okay, have you got that? Are you there? And this is the song of Deborah. Now, someone in the little group I was in said that her favorite um, Bible characters and stories were Esther and Ruth, and I was thinking, ah ha ha, because we're going to be looking at another uh, great female leader. Um, and this is a little contrast. Um, we're going to collect some images, some more pictures in our minds um, to put alongside those images of Saul or Paul. Look at chapter, uh, chapter five. This is a poem and verse six. Now, I don't ask people to read this because it's got a lot of names in it. And you pick your enemies when you ask them to read biblical passages, lots of names. Or I ask my husband to do it because he oh, can do it. Yeah. Uh, but it says, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anna, in the days of jail, caravans ceased and travellers kept to the byways. In other words, there was no more capacity for doing business. It's not caravans this time. It's not the tourists that get on the roads and annoy all the drivers by driving slowly. This is uh, caravans that were carrying out trade. They were going from place to place. The caravans ceased. And why did they cease? Because it was dangerous to travel. Travellers kept to the byways. Remember that story of uh, that Christian man um, coming out of Aleppo and having to get off the main roads as quickly as possible and take the goat tracks, the cart tracks across the mountains, uh, which are dangerous enough on their own, um, to travel by the byways. And so at this time in Israel, um, the, it was dangerous to travel. It was dangerous to, to trade. And think again of the, those businessmen um, whose livelihoods were burnt and possibly they themselves might have been killed. So that was a time when Israel um, was in great danger uh, because they, the story is in, in, in the book of Judges that they had turned away from God. And so the enemies that were all around them came into the land 
and made it too dangerous to carry out day-to-day -day life. And all around the state of Israel, you know that Damascus, Syria, was one of those places. And Damascus appears time and time again, right through the Old Testament, as either um, an insidious uh, power working within Israel or as one of the enemies outside. Look it up sometime. Look up the word Damascus in the Bible. You, you just look at what's happening um, as that story interweaves the story of Israel. And then have a look on um, at verse 10 of chapter 5. Now, this is after the victory has been won and Israel has been delivered from their enemies. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way to the sound of the musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the triumphs of the Lord. So now people can travel at ease. They can even walk through the countryside. They can put their uh, trading goods on their donkeys. They can sit on their rich carpets. They can carry trade goods with them and they can travel at peace. And also the arts are restored. The musicians can play. And some, some of the versions, maybe your version that you're reading, um, says these are the women by the watering places and of course they're singing that's where they gather together and they tell the stories they tell the stories of the uh, triumphs of Israel and no doubt also gossip about their neighbors as we know from the story of the Samaritan woman in the Bible um, in the New Testament so there's singing and there's storytelling there's safety there's security and ordinary life is restored people can live again they can live in uh, their 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 day to day lives, so you remember the two stories. Saul Paul has the, the the scales fall from his eyes and his life is transformed. He can live uh, God's calling again, but on the other side, he's taken up in a basket and has to escape because life is dangerous and difficult. Now here are two more to set alongside them. There's the danger of travelling by the back way, back routes. And there's the singing and the traveling and the trading, normal life again. So we're going to turn to another set of passages now. And I might ask a couple of people to get a voice from my, a break from my voice, um, to read a couple of passages this time. So if you're feeling brave, this is Deuteronomy um, chapter 28. And if a couple of people are feeling brave, they might read a couple of passages from Deuteronomy 28. So be thinking about that for a minute. And they're really almost the same passage, but again, seen from opposite sides. And one of them is Deuteronomy chapter 28 um, and verses 1 to 6. And the other one is Deuteronomy 28 verses 15 to 19. Okay, so it's 1 to 6 and 15 to 19. And if uh, somebody would like to unmute him or herself and read verses 1 to 6, that would do us all a great service. Um, shall I share? Lovely. Um, reading from scripture, Deuteronomy um, ch chapter 28, verses 1 to 6. 1 to 6. If you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you High above all the nations of the earth. All the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of the cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Lovely. Thank you very much. That, that's a lovely, lovely passage. Um, but here, the opposite, remember that we're looking at two different sides here. And if somebody would unmute him or herself and read verses 15, to 19. Okay, do you want me to do that, Jana? Yeah, lovely, thank you. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands and 
peace I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. The basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. And the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Yes. You see how that echoes the first passage. Mm -hmm. And if you just sneak an eye down um, after verse 19 there, um, you see that the Lord will send upon you disaster, panic and frustration in everything that you do, attempt to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly. So there's the, the, the panic, the anxiety, the danger. And just look at, back at verses one to six, because it's nicer to look at. Um, but there you can see how it's just the ordinary things of life that uh, God will bless. It's nothing big and dramatic. It's um, the, the city and the field. Um, I'm in a small market town, Bedford. Um, you're in villages, towns, cities, I don't know where, lots of different places. Um, but in wherever you are, just the place you live, um, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your fields, the things that you do, your, your business, your life, um, your cattle and so on, um, the, the, your kitchen, the, your basket, your kneading bowl. And when you go out and when you come in, you can travel, you can move from place to place. How lovely that would be been a long time since we can move freely we've been able to move freely so the pandemic is in the back of our minds now as well as the stories dreadful stories we've been hearing it's difficult now if you if you're running a business then life is very hard for you um we are bunyan meeting employees two or three staff um we're looking with with some trepidation into the future um and so are our staff we should care for them the ordinary things of life are very difficult at the moment. So there are the two sides again. So keep those images in your mind. Because again and again, God says to us, I don't want you to perish. It's not my will. I take no pleasure in the death of a righteous man. I take no pleasure in destruction and um, uh, captivity in uh, danger and hardship. God says um, that he's on the side of those who are victims. He cares for those who are poor. So if we're looking at the two sides, God is seeking to transform our lives. Later on in Deuteronomy, um, he says, see, I lay before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. And he might have left it at that, mightn't he? He might have said, you know, you've got to choose, choose one of those. But I always feel that God says, I can't bear to leave it at that. Therefore, choose life. The two um, sides are there. But God calls us to choose life. And so we're going to end by turning to Isaiah chapter 35. And I'm not going to ask anyone to read again now. So just have a look through this passage. I just was going to choose some verses. Um, but it's all lovely. You know those hymns where you think, we'll omit verse. Oh, no, we can't omit that one. Well, maybe we'll, oh, no, we can't omit that one. And you end up singing 15 verses. Maybe you <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, but look at Isaiah 35 and take this away with you and, and have a look at it later. Here is what God longs for for us. And Isaiah's full of this. Look at Isaiah 65 if you've got time. Um, look at the passage that says, um, everyone neath his vine and fig tree shall live in peace and unafraid. This is what God longs for us. The wilderness and dry land shall be glad, Isaiah uh, 35, um, the be beginning there. Look on um, at verses three to four. Strengthen your weak hands. Um, say to those who are fearful, reach out to those who are fearful. Be strong. Don't be afraid. Here is your God. And then um, in verse five, the healing, the transformation. Uh, verse seven, the thirsty ground spring will be springs of water, the burning sand, a pool. And in verse eight, a highway shall be there. And at the end, in verse 10, the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Read those passages through for yourselves at some point. And uh, just think about where we are in the story, in the picture. For sure, 
we're living in a world which is uh, dangerous and is, we, we, um, we are like Saul, some fall sometimes hanging in a basket, hanging on, not knowing what was going to happen, but in the hands of our gods and in the prayers of our friends. But God's longing is for transformation. And Jesus, so often quoted from the prophet Isaiah, and where he was, the eyes of the blind were opened, the scales fell from people's eyes, and they looked on Jesus, and their lives were transformed, and they were saved. And so, hallelujah, and so amen to that. Hold those images in your mind's eye, and praise and thank God that the scales have fallen from your eyes by his grace, and that you have been transformed, no matter how fearful life is. Pray for others who are living through terrible times, because God has saved you so that you can pray and trust in Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say the grace, um, not that we're all about to eat, well, perhaps you are, but the grace, because when we try and say it together on Zoom, um, it's very difficult for us to do because our, all our timings are wrong. So please um, pray with me as we say the grace together and then we hand back um, to Martin to close this time together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you, Janet, for leading us through that uh, uh, session that you had there. It got us looking at the Old Testament. Uh, and as I know Christians in West Wales, sometimes we don't always go to the Old Testament as often as we should, I think. So that was, uh, that was excellent. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and the links that you made. And the message, of course, that the Old Testament can speak to us today uh, just as much as the New Testament. And I think that, that's something that we need to reinforce. Uh, the stories there and the experiences there. Uh, real life experiences for many in the world today, especially the people of Aleppo and Syria, as we've uh, heard uh, all, all morning. So thank you uh, very much uh, for that. Uh, I meant to close the session, I think, um, by bidding farewell to everyone. But before I come to bidding farewell and giving a benediction, uh, I think uh, we need to give our thanks to all those who've, first of all, organised uh, this morning, because uh, even though we may have been on here for a couple of hours, uh, it takes just as long and even longer to prepare and, and get things uh, ready. And I know Chris and Matthew in particular have been uh, working in the background to, to get us up to uh, this point. So grateful thanks to, to you, to everybody that's taken part, and indeed to all of you who've joined us uh, this morning as well. Uh, of course, we find that uh, there are those that are very comfortable and confident in using the modern technology, and there are those that will uh, never ever touch it. And we have to get some balance there somewhere. So my uh, message will always be, uh, tell those people who weren't here how good it was and how much you enjoyed it and encourage them perhaps to join us in uh, future events that, that we might have. And even if it means, whatever the rules say at the moment, even if it means you go and visit somebody perhaps in your bubble that has a computer, or a phone where you can access the things uh, with them. I think that's the way forward. Thank you for what you're doing for your churches in your own community. As Congregationalists, the local church is very, very important, of course. Uh, keep writing to people, keep sending out your cards to people, uh, and make sure that those that perhaps won't see many uh, visitors over the coming weeks, because we, goodness knows what's going to be announced with us on Monday or Tuesday in Wales, uh, would surely appreciate even a short word from you, even if it's a postcard saying you're on holiday in Upper Kung Cabbage or wherever you're in lockdown, uh, and and uh, and just just send that uh, that on. So I think that's that's enough of a, of a farewell. I will say farewell to you, and I'm going to turn to um, a blessing from Numbers, uh, very familiar to you. The Lord bless you and keep you, uh, which is Numbers six twenty four to twenty six. I'll give you a moment to look that up because I'm going to say it in Welsh when I come to that point. But uh, here I'm going to be uh, offering a short prayer and then offering the 
a blessing uh, in, in, in Welsh. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. Because I know a lot of you English Kongs, as we call you down here in Wales, uh, don't always have the language of heaven uh, in, in your vocabulary. So let's turn to God in prayer as we thank him for everything we've gone through uh, this morning. Heavenly God, we thank you for the new and different ways in which we are able to come together in this strange environment in which we live. We thank you for all those who have contributed to our time together this morning, those who have prepared and those who have offered their thoughts and those who have helped us to pray. And we thank you for all those who have been able to join us under what must be difficult circumstances and situations in many parts of Wales. We, of course, hold in our prayers our sisters and brothers in Christ in Syria and Aleppo in particular, and indeed in all the places where Christians even today face persecution. We continue to pray, Lord, that you lead us, lead us to be the church, lead us to be the individual Christians you want us to be, that we continue to share our hope in these difficult times. Father God, we bring all our prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. But the dear Arglue, the Varchi, I uina barnat, a board and regarod urthit. But the dear Arglue, Edrich Arnat, a roy et heduch. Amen. Amen. Bit of Celtic prayer for you there. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Is it back to you, Chris, or are we just saying farewell? Maybe we'll just say say farewell to each other. Unmute yourselves Bye. and say goodbye. How about that? <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. It's been brilliant. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. 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 See you. See you. Bless you, Maura. See you. Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye Maya. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye, Sarah. Bye. See you in Rose Garden. Definitely. See ya. Bye.